So now what I want to switch gears and, and, and spend a few minutes talking about the software. Because the software, again, is really the, the true interface between the child and the learning that happens. And the software is called Sugar for completely arbitrary reasons. The name just stuck. And, you know, it's sweet. But the, um, but call it whatever you want. If you want to use it, it's free software and you can change the name. You just can't change the license. It's always free software. You can't change that. But um, what we tried to do with Sugar was take, take the software and try to use it to try to steer the kids towards behaviors that we think are important to learn. And in particular, we tried to steer them towards behaviors such as lots of doing, lots of making things. We tried to steer them towards behavior that includes a lot of reflection on what they're doing. And we tried to steer them towards behaviors where they're collaborating with each other and engaging in critique with each other. So they're working together and helping to critique each other. So everything we did in the software, we took sort of a traditional desktop, which is designed for office work, and we threw most of it away. And we reassembled it into a set of utilities that promote these types of activities. So this is what the Sugar desktop looks like. And each kid chooses a set of colors to represent themselves, and they're, they're in the center of their desktop. And all around them are different activities. And you have to actually, so if you want to clock back to 2005 when we started working on this, there was no iPhone or iPad or Android or any of that kind of stuff. But actually, all that kind of stuff sort of looks like sugar today. So I think we were on to something. Everything runs full screen. There's not lots of little windows. There's no double clicking. None of this fancy sort of fiddly stuff you have to do. The reason for that, I, I have this thesis that double clicking is a conspiracy to keep the elderly from using computers. Because if you have a little bit of arthritis in your wrist, you can't double click. So you're out. You can't play. And actually, as, as, as fancy and as compelling and chic as all these, you know, I, this is an I, that's are, with all their fancy little things, I actually think that those devices also are keeping the elderly away from computing. Because it's, it's, those manipulations are too difficult for, for, for their, their arthritic hands. But in any case, kids love it. Kids love all that stuff. And the next generation of the laptop has touch. We couldn't afford touch in the first generation. But now touch has come down enough in price, we can put touch in. But um, the point is that you're surrounded by stuff. And the stuff you're surrounded by, some of it is sort of the usual suspect. So we've got a web browser. We've got a multimedia recorder, paint program. We've got um, a, um, somewhere around, we've got a word processor. We also have, you know, we've got a calculator. We have, then we have a bunch of games, because kids like games. And we have stuff that teachers like, like mind maps and spreadsheet tools and all that kind of stuff. But then we get to the stuff that's the interesting stuff. The interesting stuff is all the, all the tools around expression. It's all about getting the kids to be expressive. And we put a big, big emphasis on music, on writing. You know, here's, here's another a tragedy. It's a particular tragedy in US schools. US schools are so hung up on their standardized tests competing with Finland on the PISA exam, that they do cram, 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 cram for mathematics. And in order to have time for cram, they had to get rid of some stuff. What they get rid of? Music, art. But if you stop and think for a second, when in school are you doing open-ended problem solving? Open-ended problem solving is happening in art class, it's happening in music class, it's not happening in math class. Math class is rote in elementary school or most elementary schools. So we're trying to bring the open-ended problem solving of expression back into the equation. So there's a big emphasis on that. There's also a really big emphasis on programming. I, want, I think that computation is right up there with reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the reason is because computation is a thing to think with. Back to Papert again. Back to what we've learned over 40 years of doing this. You can engage kids in debugging, engage, engage kids in problem solving. It's not about turning every child into a computer scientist. It's about giving every child a free place to explore problem solving, explore making mistakes, and programming is mostly making mistakes, and, and having a lot of fun. It's 
program actually is, is a lot of fun. The program we do with the kids is mostly around multimedia, around expression. Uh, it's, it's, it's lots of cool stuff, but it, it's also real. It's program. And everything we do in Sugar, we try to have a low floor. We want to make it easy for the kids to get started. But again, as we know from the whole wall project, kids are going to learn how to use these things. But we put no ceiling. Let me give an example of music. I don't know if it's on this particular slide, but I can show you after. I don't, I don't see the room. We've got a little program of music called Tam Tam. You use Tam Tam Mini, it's just the, you choose an instrument, you pound on the keys, you make it music. It's a single voice, one note at a time, one instrument at a time. But it's a lot of fun. And I've got a friend in Brazil that can make some pretty good sound. From the you go from Tam Tam Mini to Tam Tam Jam, you're, you're connected over that peer to peer network, you've got garage game, you've got a village orchestra. And in Thailand, the kids went even a step further, invited their parents in with the traditional instruments, and they jammed together. It's brilliant. It's really great. Then you go to Tam Tam Edit, which lets you compose music. Then you go to the synthesizer lab that lets you design your own instrument. Because we only give the kids a couple of hundred instruments in Tam Tam. <laughs> there are more instruments than that, and let them design their own instruments. And then you go from there, the kids that want to can pull it apart and look inside and discover this programming language called C Sound, which is what it's all built on top of. C Sound is a professional grade tool for music composition. When they make, probably in Bollywood as well, but I know for a fact that Hollywood, uh, all the music special effects are done with C Sound. So we start with Tam Tam Mini, which is a tool that literally a two year old can use to a progression up to the same tools that the pros use. And it's all there, so there's a mountain to climb. Not every child climbs the, the, the music mountain, but the music mountain is there to climb if they choose to. No ceiling. And we try to do that across everything we do. So we have, you know, again, the, the, the typical stuff you'd expect, learn to read programs. This is learn to read in Spanish, of course. Um, e-books. Now we've got abacus. And I actually I met somebody at a conference yesterday who's fascinated with abacus and thinks that abacus is sort of a, the way to teach kids mathematics. There are actually a lot of programs around using abacus for mathematics. Um, I had a, a slightly different goal with this abacus program. Um, I was visiting my mother and I found this book I had as a child how to program how to use the Chinese abacus. Chinese abacus, it's called a sompong. Sompong. And uh, these are ones, these are tens, these are hundreds, these are fives, fifties, five hundreds. You slide the beads around and you add and subtract it. In this book, it even described how to multiply and divide. And so I said, you know, this is great, Let's, I'll write an abacus program. But I didn't write just an abacus program for the Chinese abacus. I also included the Japanese abacus that's a little bit different. I even included the Mayan abacus. The Mayans you know, in Mexico had a mathematics based 20. So these beats are 20s and 100s instead of 10s and 50s. Um, so, and I have a binary abacus, a hexadecimal abacus, lots of different representations because so the abacus was invented over and over and over again in different cultures. And I give the children this breadth, because I want them to see that there's more than one representation. Marvin Minsky once said, if you don't understand something in more than one way, you don't understand it. So I want to give them this breadth of representation. And, but, but then I, I, but with sugar, we go a little bit further. And with sugar, there's this, this little button here on a lot of sugar activities. And the gear is an invitation to the kids to say, hey, look, I've shown you something. Now you've shown me what you've got. And so I've shown you different representations of abacus from around the world. Now you show me what abacus you're going to make. If you were going to invent an abacus, what would it be like? And so they can make their own abacus. And oftentimes I start off and I say, well, you know, the Sumerians never invented an abacus. Sumerians, who are they? Well, the Sumerians are the ones that had a mathematics based on 12. And they actually did a lot of interesting math 
very influential math because we have 12 hours, we have 60 minutes, we have 60 seconds. There's a lot of Sumerian mathematics in our lives today. They were pretty influential, but they never invented an abacus. So I say to the kids, what would a Sumerian abacus have looked like if they had invented it? Well, it would be base 12. It would look like this. So the kids can make their own abacus. And they can say, well, okay, let me make one. And they can make all sorts of strange things. But the idea is that they don't just receive the wisdom, but they also make the challenge, they give them the opportunity. I, I can't force them to do this, but I give them the sugar price, I give them the opportunity. And by peppering sugar full of these little gears, and we're, we're sort of suggesting over and over again, we're re reinforcing the message that you too have ideas, you too can be expressive, you too have something to contribute. And you notice, but the abacus that they designed is on par with all the other abacus. It's just as important, it's just as valid, mathematically it's identical. They're all the same. Their representation is equal to all the others. So there's a message there as well. That what they do is valid. What they do is real. Now, this, is, this, this next thing is sort of tied to the free software bit for a second. On sugar, I don't, know, I don't know where the laptop is, but as it passes around, on the, on the space bar, you'll see there's a little gear. Probably most of you didn't notice it. A little gear symbol. And if you hit function gear, this appears. And what this is, this is the source code to whatever program you're running. The source code to whatever program you're running is always one mouse click away in sugar. And some of that is because Philosophically, we want to not have any black boxes, but the real reason is quite pragmatic. We want the, the, we want the kids to be able to poke around and mess around with the software. So this is the, the source code of the Abacus program, and if they click here, they get the source code of Sugar itself. And, they, and if you hold your, your mouse on top of this, another button appears called Duplicate. And if you click on Duplicate, you get your own version of Abacus. It's called copy on write, which means that if I, make, if I break my copy of Abacus, there's no penalty. I can make mistakes and not have it cost me anything. I can break it, and the teacher won't get mad at me because I broke my copy, not the copy I needed to do my homework. Now, this all sounds very esoteric, and who would ever do this? But it turns out it's not so esoteric. It turns out to be quite pragmatic. I was in a... In a in uh, Amazonas Peru, which is more remote than any place in India. And we were running a workshop with teachers, and the teachers encountered a bug in one of the programs. And at first they were tempted to call the uh, Microsoft 800 number in Redmond and see if they could send a technician down. No, not really. They knew that, that any problem they encountered, they had to deal with because they were in the middle of nowhere. They had to stand on their own. So I showed them view source, they found the problem, and they fixed it. And in fact, then we took their solution to that problem, sent it up to the source code repository, and everybody else in the world got the solution to the problem that the teachers in Amazon has discovered and fixed. Teachers in Compagnie took them one step further. Teachers in Kakape, when they saw the advocacy program, they said, this is cool, but we're teaching the kids fractions. Wouldn't it be cool if there was an advocacy that we could use for adding and subtracting fractions? And so they talked about it, and they invented an advocacy, the Kakape advocacy. It's new to the world. This advocacy never existed before. This is their invention. And this advocacy lets you add and subtract fractions. Teachers invented this. When people tell you, that there's, there's a, a dirty little secret that nobody tells you, and that's that teachers can learn too. Mm -hmm. Your teachers can learn. And when you're a teacher, you can learn. So this is a, a, a little charting program. And it's, it's kind of fun. You can take data from a lot of different sugar activities and drop it into this charting program, makes pie charts and bar graphs and stuff like that. Simple little bit called simple graph, because it's pretty simple. It's, it's actually pretty nice. 
nicely crafted program. The reason why I'm showing you this is because this program, like more than 10% of all sugar programs, was written by a preteen. This program was written by a 12 year old. The kids are pretty good at learning too. The kids have appropriated the project. The kids are making this happen. Over 10% of the sugar activities were written by kids 12 years and older. And the kids that were 12 and now are 13 are, are actually writing sugar now. They're not just writing sugar activities, they're working on sugar itself. So the numbers. Let me back, look, I'll go through the numbers and I want to tell you more specifically what the problem is, what the case is. So we've got actually about two and a half million of the, the laptops out in the field. 75% of them are in Latin America, a bunch of them in Africa, very few in, uh, in Asia, a fair number in Oceania, uh, some in North America, almost none in India. Um, but there are, you know, there are a billion kids without them. So, you know, I'm proud of touching the lives of two million kids, but they're, you know, that, that's nothing compared to the billion kids that need it. Um, again, the price is, is, is less than $200. It's going down, not fast enough, but it's going down. Um, every laptop out there is running free software. We've got language projects. It's very easy to localize to a local language. In fact, this afternoon we're meeting with uh, some uh, local uh, language experts in uh, downtown to talk about getting uh, a more complete translation of the local dialects here. Um, we're going to be doing both the um, uh, Barangabi and also the Romani versions of, of the language. And we've got um, you know, again, over 500 sugar activities. I ran a workshop last night with about 50 engineering students that are anxious to add to that number and, and will. So you know, the, the real problem, you know, I don't expect you to get the price down. The price is going to come down based on any number of factors over time. And again, since I'm the software guy, I want to whatever device you give me that's, that's out there. I have some preferences of one approach than another. For example, you know, this thing here, this is called keyboard. This apparently has gone out of fashion. People like keyboards anymore. People like virtual keyboards and they like typing with their thumbs. And we, we give, we were, we, there's a big plan in, in Udi, I think. I think it's Indian. That wants to give kids uh, tablet computers. And I, I have to ask myself I don't know a single software engineer, I don't know a single journalist, I don't know a single anyone who takes writing seriously as part of their occupation who wouldn't prefer to have a keyboard. And since my goal is to get the kids to write and program, to take the keyboard away to me is like tying their hands behind their backs. Why are we doing that? The keyboard doesn't cost anything. There's no cost in this. So to me, it's sort of, you know, again, it's very fashionable to have a tablet. But to me, it's kind of silly. But I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to fight that battle. So sugar, we're doing a lot of work on making sugar run as well as possible on a tablet. So, if we, if we handicap you by taking away your tablet, your keyboard, you can still use sugar. Uh, but you'd be happier if you had a keyboard, if you wanted to type or program. Uh, you know, um, who am I? You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Mine is, well, I, don't, I forget what the expression is. Like, do or die and let the, the bureaucrats make the decisions. Um, this is the problem. This is the problem I want you to think about. How do we bridge that? How do we reach more kids with these ideas? And I can tell you a little bit about some of the approach we've taken in the past. Some of, some of us work, some of us has worked. When we started the project, we thought, boy, this is so great, everybody's going to want it. And we went around to heads of state. And just about every single head of state we talked to said, this is great, we want it. 
There are, what, 250 countries in the world, and we talk to just about every single head of state. I even talked to Gaddafi in Libya about this project. He said he wanted it. The problem is, they all, it's easy, it, it, it's what, what Mary Poppins called a pie plus pause. It's easy to make, easy to break. It's, it, you know, the president says, I'm all for this, gets the picture in the paper, I'm all for this. But that doesn't mean they actually have to do it. And of the 250 heads of state in the world, three of them did it. So we sort of played that, that, that card. We got every kid in Uruguay, a lot of kids in Peru, a lot of kids in Luanda by playing that card. But that, then that played out. And maybe there'll be another way. I mean, we, we came pretty close in a few other places. We had a pretty good relationship in, 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 in Pakistan with the Prime Minister, but then the Prime Minister got kicked out. We had a very good relationship. We had actually the, just when the, the, the ink wasn't quite dry enough on the check in Thailand, and the Prime Minister got kicked out. So, um, you know, bad luck in some cases. But still, no, then it would have been five instead of three. That model, that top down, model works, but not often enough to address this problem. So what else have we tried? The thing we're doing a lot of right now is public-private sector partnerships. So for example, we're working with a foundation associated with a bank in Nigeria, not Nigeria, in Nicaragua, uh, the Zamora Foundation. And the Zamoras have put 30,000 laptops into the hands of kids in Nigeria, which doesn't sound like a lot, but Nigeria is actually a pretty small country. 30,000 is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an impact. And the idea behind it is to demonstrate to the government that this can work in our country. And so they've demonstrated to the Nigerian government, the Nicaraguan government, sorry, I keep on thinking, I just have NI in my head, like Nigeria said Nicaragua. But, um, They've demonstrated this can work, and uh, you know, slowly the government's starting to get behind it, but it's a much more of a, a bottom-up approach. Um, we've tried, I mean, I'm here, I mean, Harriet has been one of our champions here in India, and she's got a school here, a school there that's doing it. The schools are thriving, uh, but the program's not expanding. We're not reaching kids, and so that's really the problem I want you guys to think about. What can we do? to reach these kids. How can we give children learning that's going to change their world? Um, and this is just, you know, this is the laptop, and all the stuff it does, sunlight readable, solar powered. This is, what's next is what you guys come up with. That's your challenge. My challenge to you is figure out, this works. Go to, the, go to the school. Go, go. Harry, Harry will take you to school. Uh, we're going to visit another school outside of Mumbai uh, tomorrow. And uh, we, we see it work. It works here. It works in Uruguay. It works everywhere. But it doesn't reach enough kids. So take the idea, turn it upside down, and figure out how to make it work.